Supreme Court's ruling this week on Montana's uh, Corrupt Practices Act, which is a law of limiting corporate contributions in the state of Montana in response to what was, and we'll hear in just a moment, um, one of the most corrupt states in the union. Um, and, and and Glenn, you were you were defending the jurisprudence and the, and the and the and the kind of free speech vision that embodied in Citizens United, and Heather made a point about this. And this is the fundamental thing I think when liberals think about speech, right? Is that is money speech, and if it is, it, it doesn't seem to operate in the way that we normally think of speech, which is that, you know, everybody has a voice and everybody can speak, but not everybody has money. And so when we come down to it and we say we're going to deregulate this, this region that I think is kind of categorically a little ambiguous, you end up with welfare mem moms on one side and the Shel Sheldon Adelsons of the world on the other. Right. And so here's my issue with this is, and, and that is a huge problem with how they're raised, and it's the central issue. But for me, you know, Citizens United has taken on this almost biblical meaning, like we talk about our politics before Citizens United and after is that we have this pristine system. This problem that you just alluded to has been plaguing our totally political right. system as a poison way before Citizens United in a fundamental and radical way. In 2009, Dick Durbin said about the Senate in which he serves, the right. banks own the place. Right. So for me, you know, whatever you want to have a, about the, a debate about the scope of the First Amendment, you're always going to have free speech problems that you have to legislate around if you approach this problem by trying to restrict the spending of money and, and political speech. And you're always going to have huge loop loopholes that corporations and oligarchs can exploit, and they've been doing that for decades. And that's why I think the much better approach, you know, you mentioned Professor Lessig earlier, um, what he has is proposals for robust campaign finance. Right. So that, you know... Public finance. Well, public finance. Right. So what, right now, welfare mothers, even if Citizens United had gone the other way, would not be able remotely to compete with the Sheldon Adelsons of the world. But if you have robust public finance, that's how you start to level the playing field. That's a much better way to get at this problem, I think. I, I think, well, I want to talk more about solutions, but, but I also want to bring Mo Montana Governor Brown Schweitzer joining us from Helena this morning. Um, Governor, I want to get first your, your, your reaction to the ruler, ruling because obviously this is grounded in a specific history of, of, of Montana politics, which doing a little cursory research around is, is pretty eye-opening. So I'd like to just get you to give us a little sense of what the rationale was for the original vision of this law. Well, 120 years ago, a couple of the richest people on the planet were in the copper business in Montana. They were the copper kings. And uh, look, they, they owned everything. They, they owned the mines. They owned the newspapers. They bought the legislature outright. In fact, when we first sent a U.S. senator to Washington, D.C., William A. Clark, one of the two copper kings, uh, he uh, advertised in his newspapers that he would pay $10,000 cash money to any Montana legislator who would vote to send him to Washington, D.C. as a U.S. senator. Remember, we didn't directly elect those senators at that point. And and so he had his henchmen standing just off of the legislative floor, and as they walked out, they handed them envelopes, and in every one of those envelopes was ten one thousand dollar bills. He went off to Washington D.C., and they, those senators refused to seat him. They said, "My God, you can't advertise. You can't in the open daylight. You can't just give ten thousand dollars to become a U.S. senator." Now they'd all bribe their way into the United States Senate, but you know, it was smaller sums of money, and it was uh, dark, and you know. Was giving them, you know, giving it to their girlfriend instead. No, they wouldn't see him. And it was Mark Twain. Samuel Clemens said that William A. Clark was uh, was the biggest scoundrel to ever serve in the United States Senate. And he went on to say, and that is saying something. And William A. Clark himself, he said, but I never bought a man that wasn't for sale. So in 1912, finally, the citizens, not the legislature, because they were all owned by the by the Copper Kings, the le the legislature wouldn't move on this because they were paid for. The, it was the referendum. The people of Montana in 1912, we passed the Anti-Corruption Act. We said, look, we're not going to allow these corporations to continue to loot and rape our land and, and kill the miners that are working in them. We're going to have a legislature that works for the people. And so for a hundred years, we did. We had a pure democracy. We had legislators who, who were farmers and lawyers, their doctors and nurses. They would serve just 90 days every other year, and they would raise three to six thousand dollars. Maximum contributions is a hundred and sixty dollars. And so we had a system that actually worked. And the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., a place where nothing works, they told us, no, we don't like your system. We think we ought to, you ought to go to the corrupt system that we're using in Washington, D.C. What could go wrong? Governor, I, I, I want to read this Mark Twain quote uh, about Senator William Clark, which our, our, um, our second producer, Allison Cook, found, which is great. He, says, he said of, of, of Clark, 
He is said to have brought, bought legislatures and ju judges as other men by food and raiment. By his example, he has so excused and so sweetened corruption that in Montana it no longer has an offensive smell. Uh, that's, good, that, that, good old days. That's Mark, that's Mark Twain on, on, um, on well, it's Senator William Clark. But I guess the question here is, uh, how much of that was the context of the time in the Gilded Age? I mean, you, you made a key point there that, I, that, that gets into the discussion we're having. You said they went to, they, he went to the Senate, the Senate refused to, to seat him, and of course all those other senators had bribed their way into the Senate as well, though with slightly more obscure and tactful means. And that's, I think the, the debate we're having at the table is, pre-Citizens United to post-Citizens United, is it just a difference in degree or is it actually a difference in kind? Wait a minute, wait, wait, Gilded Age? You're calling that the Gilded Age and this is not the Gilded Age? Oh, but they, they were pikers compared to what we're doing now. You know, in 1977, Congress passed le legislation, that the, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. You can't bribe foreign officials. So Walmart got into big trouble because they went down to Mexico and they gave $20 million so they could build a Walmart in a place where people were buried or something. And they got in trouble not in Mexico. They got in trouble in the United States because we have a monopoly on bribery in this country. If you're going to bribe a politician and you're an American company or an American individual, you got to give it to American politicians. You can't give it to a foreigner. That I what, what kind of system is this, <laughs> Governor? Um, I want you to I want you to stay with us because I want to get 